Let me start this talk with the good news that, as forecast at the, in my talk at the Arizona Council on Economic Education almost exactly two years ago, the USA continues to reverse its downward trend and has now risen by two points to take fifth place in the World Competitiveness Report, which was released just a few days ago. Allow me to quote from the report. The US economy is getting back on track. The deleveraging process, a financial term, don't need to understand it particularly. The deleveraging process in the banking sector continues to show positive effects on the stability and efficiency of the country's financial markets. At the same time, the assessment by business of public institutions is slightly more positive, which is a hopeful outcome after a number of years of weakening confidence in the area. Overall, many structural features continue to make the US economy extremely productive. US companies are highly sophisticated and innovative, supported by an excellent university system that collaborates admirably with the business sector in research and development. Combined with flexible labor markets and the scale opportunities afforded by the sheer size of its domestic economy, the largest in the world by far, these qualities continue to make the United States very competitive." Unquote. Naturally, you and I can discuss all the many weaknesses that remain, and I'm sure we're all aware of these weaknesses. Uh, the most significant of these weaknesses is, of course, the current standoff between your two political parties. Uh, surely the most substantial sign of the weak state of your democracy at present, which is a result of 30 years of attacks on the middle class in this country, uh, resulting, of course, in the continuing shutdown which is damaging your country's international standing. However, just as the US continues to improve from a very weak position, uh, began in, 19, in 2007, this weak position, and in many ways, of course, still continues, so India is recovering from an extremely weak position in the last few quarters. With one of the world's highest rates of economic growth having been subjected to the storm of international capital movements in the spring, as the position in the US suddenly improved following talk of the tapering off of the Federal Reserve's economic stimulation efforts. Even though that has remained largely talk, of course, it did focus investor attention on the US, and therefore away from all the BRIC countries, uh, most significantly, of course, from India. While it also encouraged speculators to target India's currency. Fortunately for India, your current standoff has meant that speculators have turned their fire on the US. So the rupee has risen from its low of 68 to the dollar to around 61, 61, 62 today. I haven't checked the exact figures because of course I've been here. But it's around 61, 62. Meanwhile, the panic about India's current account deficit has been brought to heel and inflation has been stabilized. Okay, at a high level, but it has been stabilized with the prospect of reducing it still further because of the excellent monsoon rains, leading me to hope that speculative attacks on the Indian rupee will not resume, or at least not with the same intensity, whenever the US shutdown comes to an end, which I'm sure we all hope will be very soon, and certainly in time to avert the global financial crisis, which will certainly ensue should the US go into default in two weeks from now, according to the latest calculations that I have seen. Let me now turn, having given that background, specifically to US India relations. The history of that relationship is, I'm sure, well known to you. First, India would probably never have become independent of the British Empire had the US not been such a strong proponent of British decolonization. Indians tend to ignore or downplay that fact, uh, focusing instead, for nationalistic reasons, on the contribution, of course, of Mahatma Gandhi, who we consider the father of our nation and who certainly played a very strong part as it were, bottom up in achieving Indian independence, though the United States helped, as it were, top down. 
through the Christian missionary movement, as we are in a Catholic institution, I think I should at least acknowledge that, uh, through the Christian missionary movement, particularly in the 20th century, non-government America played a huge part in building the national identity, as well as the country as a whole, through contributions to education, medicine, language, literature, culture, and so on. Uh, if you're interested in that, and some of you may be Catholics or Christians or otherwise interested, do, by the way, read uh, two books, or one of two books, by Dr. Vishal Mangalwadi. I'll, I'll write his name down in a moment. Uh, whose two books, India, The Grand Experiment, which, by the way, is sadly now out of print, but you can get it on Amazon, India, The Grand Experiment, and uh, his second book, which is his most recent book to be published in the US, a book titled The Book That Made Your World, published uh, two years ago by Thomas Nelson in this country. Uh, if you haven't read either book, you will find them absolutely fascinating reading. Let me write his name down. It's a long Indian name. I'm not sure if you can read that, uh, but if you can't, then you'll have to come up afterwards and see it. Mangalwadi, Indian names tend to be long, I'm afraid. So uh, quite often long, so that is his name. In addition to such non-government contributions, which still continue, to continue, of course, through a range of non-profit organizations, India actually has a huge number of non-profit organizations, depending on whose statistics you believe. Uh, the non-profits range from 40,000 to 40 million. We don't quite know how many the exact number is, and of course it depends how you measure it, how big they have to be before you measure it, and so on. But the numbers are mind-boggling in terms of the non-profit organizations that exist in India. Um, in addition to these non-profit efforts, civil society efforts, there was an incredible amount of government-to-government -government aid offered by the US after Indian independence. But because, primarily because US aid tends to be tied to US commercial interests, particularly big business interests, India went for a non-aligned position between the US and the Soviet Union, becoming one of the pioneers and founding members of the non-aligned, so-called non-aligned bloc. In practice, however, India was much closer to the Soviet bloc, always abstaining or voting with the United uh, the USSR rather than the US position when it came to any debates in the United Nations. In fact, India's strategic cooperation with the Soviet Union extended to military relations with Moscow, and its mildly, India's mildly socialist policies also, of course, affected the relationship with the United States. After the fall of the Berlin Wall and the breakup of the Soviet Union in 1991, India was, as you might expect, forced to rethink its position in relation to foreign policy and started developing closer ties both with the United States and with the European Union. Especially as the country was, excuse me, I'll just grab some water. Especially as the country was forced to take a more fully capitalist path through so-called economic liberalization in the same year. Since then, except for the last few quarters, the Indian economy has grown very rapidly, with rather close links developing between the Indian and American computer and internet industries, and uh, some of you will be interested to know also between the Indian and American film industries, movies. So that was one aspect, close links on this commercial front. The second was a political move, and that was the reversal in 2008 of the long-standing American opposition to India's nuclear program. And the third aspect was large-scale immigration, large-scale, not in Indian terms, but in American terms, large-scale emigration from India to the USA. So that the number of Indians, Indian origin Americans, is now some 3.18 million according to the Pew report last year. That is something like 250 times the number in 1960 when there were only 12,000 immigrants from India. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm not sure what's happening. I think it's probably a bit of an allergy. 
but uh, according to that very Pew report, Indian Americans are the best educated people group in the United States and belong to the highest income group, having a median household income of $88,000, much higher than for all Asians, $66,000, and much higher than the US average, which is only $49,800. Conversely, the share of adult Indian Americans who live in poverty is only 9%, lower than the rate for all Asian Americans, which is 12%, as well as the national rate, which is 13%. The influence of this sizable and resource-rich Indian American community is reflected in its having the largest country-specific caucus in the US Congress. And the Obama administration has, I am told, more political appointees from the Indian American community than from any other ethnic community, uh, excluding whites, of course. Incidentally, the divorce rate among Indian Americans is only 3%, in contrast to the national average of 40 to 50%. And uh, just by the way, the divorce rate for second marriages tends to be even higher than for first marriages. And I've not seen the statistics on this, but I should not be surprised if uh, now that the US has started including gay couples among the married, if the official divorce rate goes even higher. On a positive note, the US also has its first Miss America of Indian origin. And India and the US share extensive cultural, strategic, military, and economic links. According to Gallup's latest annual public poll, published actually just a few months ago, June, 78% of Indians view India as a friend or an ally. The relations between the US and India continue to have their ups and downs. For example, the Indian Prime Minister's visit to the US a few days ago produced no major step forward for relations between the two countries. But perhaps it is unrealistic to expect major announcements on every visit when relations are already so good. If you ask me to put a date on which the tide turned from the negative pre-fall of the Berlin Wall to the positive, which it is now, I would suggest that the date is 2001. After the September 11 attacks against the US, the two countries worked together in controlling and policing the Indian Ocean sea lanes from Suez all the way through to Singapore and Japan, which are, of course, completely critical, not just to security, but also to trade, to world trade. The December 2004 tsunami resulted in similar close cooperation between the US and India, not only in the initial search and rescue and all that operations, but also in the reconstruction of affected areas. Our two countries signed an open skies agreement in 2005 to enhance trade, tourism, and business by means of increasing the number of flights between our countries. Also in 2005, a bilateral agreement on science and technology cooperation was signed. And after Hurricane Katrina, India donated $5 million to the American Red Cross and sent two plane loads of relief supplies and materials to help the United States. All this is because India and the US increasingly regard each other as indispensable partners. India is seen as a counterweight to what had been the growing clout of China though China has now begun, in my view, its decline, while the US and India share political systems, geopolitical interests, and more important, common values in the areas of countering Islamic extremism, in the area of energy security, and of course, in climate change. I know there are differences, but the differences are minor compared to the commonalities. The 2005 U.S.-Indian Treaty on Civilian Nuclear Cooperation, to which I've hinted a bit already, reversed three decades of American non-proliferation policy. So it was really an enormous step for the United States to abandon its policy, global policy on nuclear non-proliferation and uh, make an exception of India and therefore, of course, to reverse its position uh, in principle overall. Also in 2005, 
the United States and India signed a 10-year defense uh, framework agreement with the goal of expanding security cooperation. The two countries now engage in numerous and unprecedented combined military exercises. The value of bilateral trade continues to grow, as does two-way investment. President Obama, during his 2010 visit to India, backed India's bid for a permanent seat in the United Nations Security Council. Though I ought to say that I'm against the expansion of that body, I thought the admission of an uncivilized country such as China to the World Trade Organization and the United Nations was a bad enough example of the degeneration of global civilization without China being added to the Security Council. Probably the most striking area of cooperation between our two countries is that regarding space. Indo-US cooperation in the space arena dates back to the very beginning of the Indian space program. The very first sounding rocket, a Nike Apache, launched from the Thumba uh, station in India in 1963, was a US-made rocket that carried instruments to conduct ionospheric experiments over the Earth's magnetic equator, which of course passes over Thumba. Several more such rockets were launched later on various scientific missions. India conducted the satellite instructional television experiment in the mid-1970s with NASA. SITE, this satellite instructional television experiment, involved deployment of direct reception t TV sets in about 2,400 villages across six states of India to receive educational programs via ATS-6, covering agriculture, family planning, health and hygiene, and so on. The experiment was at the time hailed as the largest technological and sociological experiment. This was followed by the establishment of the multipurpose Indian National Satellite System in the 1980s. All the four satellites under this satellite program were built by a US company to India's specifications, and three of them were put into orbit by US launch vehicles, um, including INSAT-1B, which is one of our uh, satellites, which was orbited by the US Space Shuttle Challenger. Today, INSAT has become one of the largest domestic satellite programs in the Asia-Pacific region, with all satellites designed and built in India. India has, since the 1960s, therefore, achieved significant progress in design, development, and operation of space systems, pioneering in using these systems for telecommunications, television broadcasting, meteorology, disaster warning, and natural, natural resource survey and management. Not only the INSAT, the Indian National Satellite System, but also IRS, Indian Remote Sensing, satellites through its remarkable PSLV and GSLV programs. The PSLV, which is the Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle, is an expendable launch system developed and operated by the Indian Space Research Organization, which allows India to launch its remote sensing satellites into sun-synchronous orbits and smaller craft into geostationary orbits. Something that was, by the way, till the PSLV was launched by India, commercially available only from Russia. According to the latest figures that I have been able to locate, the PSLV has so far launched 63 satellites and other craft into space, 28 of them Indian, 35 of them non-Indian. In the field of remote sensing, India was one of the first countries to establish a reception station for receiving satellite data from NASA's, from NASA's Earth Resources Technology Satellite, which was, by the way, later renamed Landsat, which some of you know. So India gained enormous experience through this cooperation with NASA in the reception, processing, and application of space-based remote sensing data. Today, India has the largest uh, const constellation, conglomeration of civilian remote sensing satellites, which, provi which provide data in a range of resolutions, spatial and spectral, received by ground stations from all over the world, including the USA, to meet the requirements of various applications in resource management, including water, food, and agriculture. The Indian Earth Observation System is expected to continue to provide operational products and services, enabling applications in several areas, 
spanning cartography to climate. So I could go on with this detail, enormous detail, just in the area of space. You can see I've spent the last seven minutes or so talking just about India, America, space collaboration. You could talk about defense, you could talk about trade, you could talk about all kinds of areas. Now, the key thing to note when it comes to the global roles of India and the US is the following. Over the last 30 years, the position of the US in around the globe has been systematically weakened by the US elite, bipartisan elite. So both parties have collaborated in weakening the position of the United States by signing, first of all, a World Trade Organization agreement by which investment flowed out of the United States and into China. So that China became the manufacturing capital of the world, and the rise of China was fueled principally by American capital. That rise, as I say, is now coming to an end. And we can see evidence of that, not just in the slowing growth trajectory of China, uh, which President Hu forecast, if I remember correctly, almost a year ago, actually just over a year ago, and which the World Bank has, as of this morning, if I remember right, uh, reduced still further. So the World Bank estimate of uh, China's growth trajectory is even weaker than what the World, World Bank had predicted uh, only a few months ago. So at the same time as the United States is withdrawing from its global role and China was rising, America now has to decide how it's going to deal with this power that was still just now rising and is now likely to decline or possibly collapse. And I suggest to you that America's very important role in relation to China is now in helping China to manage its decline, or at least to enable China to remain at a more or less reasonable plateau rather than collapsing, which of course would not be good for any of us. At the same time, as India has been rising till just a few quarters ago, uh, and now is in this position to which I referred, uh, India finds itself in a new situation, which I will go on to describe briefly, where Indian and American strategic interests coincide. I'm afraid that India's perception from the United States tends to be colored by the mass media here in the United States, which, in my view, are controlled by big business. And so there is a kind of big business view of India. So if India delivers to big business, this is great. And so you, know, you get a kind of positive view of India. In so far as India does not deliver to US big business, this is terrible because India is a disappointing partner and so on. But if you look at India from the Indian perspective, not from the US big business perspective, you will see that India is still going through a process of transformation and there is, in fact, a new India that's emerging. What do I mean when I say there's a new India emerging? I mean that the groundwork has been laid, the foundations have been laid for a new and genuinely equitable rule-based society in India. Uh, India's constitution put into place values that are directly opposed to the kind of traditional culture we had. And the kinds of new values that the constitution put into place were values of equality, fraternity, liberty, and so on, which were not part of our traditional culture. So there has been a culture clash between the values of the constitution and the values of the average Indian. And over time, constitutional values have, of course, progressed. But from, from time to time, they have encountered resistances, opposition, and outright uh, pushback. So what we are seeing in India at the moment is the result of that culture clash between the traditional values of India, which are nothing to do with constitutional values, and the new constitutional values which have been systematically inculcated by the Constitution, and whose antecedents, of course, go back to roughly the early 19th century. What do I mean when I say that a new foundation has been laid for the progress of India? I mean the following. Till recently, there was no national framework for land acquisition. And one of the great problems, whether you were a small company or a big company, acquiring agricultural land for industrial purposes was that it was a matter of individual negotiation. Sometimes it worked. More often, it did not work. And because of this lack of legal clarity about land acquisition, we had not the kind of progress in manufacturing industrialization as we should have done. Now we have, for the first time, a national 
a national system, a national legal framework for the acquisition of land for industrial purposes. One example. A second example. You know, you may know that the Supreme Court banned mining throughout the country. And the reason it banned mining throughout the country was because of disputes between forest dwellers, which is mostly where the mineral resources are. Uh, these are traditional societies going back a long way, tribal societies, not mainstream societies such as you see usually represented in the United States. And these tribal societies began to resist the exploitation of mineral resources which they saw as belonging to them. And so there is a conflict, there has been a conflict, between the interests of companies and the interests of the Indian government, of course, in gaining access to these resources and the interests of these tribal groups that would rather not allow access at very cheap prices to these resources. Well, this standoff has continued for decades and became a very sharp conflict just in the last, I would say, seven to ten years. Finally, the Indian government has got its act together just in the last few weeks and we have, for the first time, a bill not just to govern the, any new contracts in the area, but also to govern the rehabilitation of tribals who are displaced by such projects and to uh, finance their recovery and their ability to survive in new situations. I could go on and on. In addition to the land acquisition bill, the, the bill in relation to forest tribals and so on, um, there is a new bill which was passed just a few weeks ago as well, which for the first time outlawed manual scavenging. This is a very exalted American style phrase, a nice long phrase, but it, what it means is that there was a caste of people whose job it was to clean human shit every morning and to physically go into sewers and clean them. Well, the Indian government, all parties, got together for the first time in spite of huge opposition to this from all kinds of interest, interested parties, got together and has now actually banned the practice. There is a food security bill which has been passed, uh, which will commit $19 billion, not an insignificant sum for India, commit $19 billion to making subsidized food available to something like three-fourths of India's population. Now, I think you know that 800 million people in India live on less than $2.50 a day. And it's these people who've been offered the opportunity now to have subsidized food so that there will be no possibility of anybody, in theory at least, no possibility of anybody starving to death or having difficulty. Then, of course, there are things like the midday meals for children in schools. There's a minimum uh, guaranteed employment act and so on. There are loads of schemes that have been launched in the last few years, but particularly the schemes that I've been mentioning, the acts and law, uh, legal frameworks that I've been mentioning, which have transformed the entire landscape of India. So that we see now a change of mood in the country, and I see now a change of attitude, particularly among young people, who don't come in with the kind of culture that my generation or people older than me did, who come in with expectations of rational decision making and of being able to find good employment and contribute to the country. So that uh, this is reflected not just in the attitudes of people, it is reflected also in the anti-corruption movement, which uh, grabbed the headlines just a few months ago, and from which has emerged a new political party, the Aam Admi Party, or AAP, which is actually expected to sweep the elections in the Delhi elections coming up in a few weeks' time. A party that didn't exist till a few months ago is now expected to sweep 60% of the seats in the capital region. This is only one of the new political parties which have started. I could mention others. Um, there is an IAS officer who, who took early retirement from the, actually resigned his position in the Indian Administrative Service and went off with his wife because his wife was offered a very good position in Australia. Worked there for, I think it was 15 years and came back to India with the intention of starting a new political party. There is Adarsh Rashtriya Vikas Party there is the Soneki Chidiya party which was started with the Australian gentleman, uh, whose name I couldn't remember for a second, uh, and so on. So there is, um, there is a new party which is drawing together the uh, Dalits, which are the traditional untouchables, the OBCs, which are the other backward castes, the Muslims, and the forest tribals, not just forest, desert area, tribals, 
and is trying to build them together into a political force which will represent 40% of the country if they can get their act together. The left parties, the communist parties, are trying to get together with the secular parties. It hasn't happened till now. So there are new constellations emerging uh, which reflect the new mood in the country. Hundreds of millions of young people are coming into, the vo uh, coming into voting age and so there is a new buzz around the country's politics. At the next national elections coming up, the public media is completely dominated by talk of whether the elections are going to be won by the traditional Congress party or by its challengers, the BJP. But in actual fact, as there are still eight months to go, it's quite possible that either an individual new party or a conglomeration of these new parties may in fact take power. From my personal point of view, I don't particularly care whether it's Congress, BJP, or some kind of third force. I'm much more interested in whether any party can, or any combination of parties, can actually implement any kind of economic program and social change program. So far, the two major parties have not demonstrated uh, any holistic ability to deliver that. And if any party does, then that party will have, of course, my support. And my support may not be that significant. I believe the, the, uh, what will be significant will be the support of many educated, thoughtful people. Uh, we are, of course, growing in number in the country uh, to such a party. I will stop there and take questions and answers. And then, if you will allow me, I will make a concluding statement uh, at the end of our time together. Thank you very much. Uh, may I suggest that you find somebody in the room you do not know and uh, just sit and chat together for maybe two minutes and uh, discuss what I've said. Some of it will be new to you. Some of it you will disagree with profoundly for ideological or other reasons. Uh, but just discuss it in twos uh, for two minutes, I would suggest. And then we'll have an opportunity to come up with questions, uh, you know, brainstorm questions and come up with perhaps some more interesting questions than you would have done otherwise. So may I suggest two minutes starting Two minutes starting now. Fifteen seconds over. Thirty seconds over. One minute gone. Forty-five seconds left. Thirty seconds left. Fifteen. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, our two minutes are up. Questions? Yeah, sure, as you like, yes. <coughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you.
Ja. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very kind. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you very much. That's most kind. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, I'm open to questions, disagreements, um, stories, comments, jokes, whatever you care to offer. Please, sir. Um, I have a philosophical position that you will probably disagree with. And my philosophical position is that every growth model has a certain DNA, which enables a being, a society, a whatever, a nation, to arise to a certain extent, but then the value of that DNA becomes less and less, and eventually collapses. Sorry? I actually do agree. My father is a uh, genetic Ah. Right, right, absolutely, yes. But it's true not just for communism, you see, it's even true for open systems, or relatively open systems. If you look at Japan, what happened to Japan? End of World War II, smashed completely zero. US Marshall Plan goes in, or equivalent goes in, helps Japan to rise up by the 60s. It begins to compete in the international arena. By the 80s, it starts displacing the US industry, you know, the threats to the auto industry. Everybody's scared about China. 25 years later, 30 years later, where is Japan? It's still the second most powerful nation economically. Hmm? But in terms of competition, and the same thing is happening to China. China has risen to the top of its, uh, e to, the, to the maximum that its economic model enables it to arise to. And unless there are fundamental political changes, which was, by the way, the reason why Japan stopped growing. And in the global economy, the way we've designed it at the moment, you either glow, grow, or you decline. And the essential problem in Japan was that Japan was not willing to take on the Yakuza, which is the Japanese mafia. Now, this is not discussions you hear about, but you know, I've lectured quite a lot in Japan, and I've studied Japan. I used to write for the Japanese Journal of Trade and Industry. And the fact is that the huge land bubble, land price bubble, uh, that made the emperor's garden in Tokyo worth more than the entire state of California at the height of the bubble. People forget that. that. The Japanese emperor's garden alone in Tokyo was worth more than the whole of California. That was the extent of the bubble. When it burst in the 80s, you know, 35 years ago, when it burst, <coughs> obviously there were bad loans. And the problem was that no bank could realize the properties, the collateral that was attached to these bad loans. Why? Because one bank manager went and tried to collect, shot. Second ban bank manager went and tried to collect, shot. After that, no chance of recovering any of these properties that were offered as collateral to these bad loans. And the Yakuza were part of the political system, as you probably know, LDP and all that. I don't want to go into it, because this is not a lecture on Japan. But that was the reason why the Japanese growth model came to a halt. One important reason, anyway. We can go into the economic reasons, but that was the socio-political reason why it stopped. In China, it's quite clear to me that any nation which, is, which does not have a free press is eventually going to start making decisions that are not optimal. If you don't have a free press, you will never get exposure of facts. You will never get things that you don't want to hear about. And as you don't get information on things you don't want to hear about, however intelligent you are, and the Chinese are very intelligent, you will not make the best decisions. And that is what is beginning to happen in China. So if you look at the excessive expansion of, in, of infrastructure which has taken place, you know, the good side is China's done far better than India in terms of offering first class, world class infrastructure. The bad side of it is it has overdone it. Uh, similarly, China has, be, has played the game of currency manipulation far better than the United States has played it. The United States has also manipulated its currency ever since it broke the gold standard in 1971. You know, it, there was a Bretton Woods agreement and so on. Uh, the United States unilaterally, quite immorally in my view, broke the agreement and started manipulating its currency. 
Uh, China said uh, 10 years later or whatever, ah, the Americans can play this game, we can play this game too. Indians were doing the same, you know, British were doing the same, everybody was manipulating the currency. Uh, Chinese were just much better than the Americans because they've got a closed system, less scrutiny. If you look at bad bank loans in, in uh, bad loans in banks in China at the moment, they had some quite astronomical figure. Nobody knows really, but from what we can make out, they're quite astronomical. So when you put all this together, you realize that the Chinese are in trouble. Uh, what we do know is that the official growth rate is somewhere between 7 and 7.5 percent, which is forecast by President Hu. And what we do know from World Bank figures as of this morning is that it's going to decline even further. We do know that any developing economy needs 8 percent growth if it's going to employ all the new graduates coming out of its universities. So China has for the first time in 30 odd years the problem of educated unemployment among its graduates. Now you can keep graduates unemployed for one year or two years or three years or four years or five years, but at some point something happens. You know it well. One of the things that I'm finding now is that um, our Chinese counterparts are pushing their sales numbers so they have access to more foreign uh, currency, exchange. foreign exchange. And because everything is controlled by, by the central bank, yes. even to get them to agree to normal business terms in terms yes. of security and all that, they have to go to the central bank. Yeah. And, uh, and the way they survive is by pushing their numbers. Yes. And of course, in any closed system, once numbers start being fudged at the bottom, they're systematically fudged. I mean, the whole Boshi Lai affair, if you've been following it, is a very good example of who knows what really happened. Who knows what really happened? It's supposed to be part of an anti-corruption uh, drive, but who defines what corruption is in the Chinese system? How do we know there's real corruption being addressed? So if it's only my political opponent's corruption that's being addressed and not the, political, uh, not the corruption of the people belonging to my party, how much of an anti-corruption drive is it? It's just a form of blackmail, right? The whole system depends on corruption. And I only attack the corruption of my political opponents or when they become political opponents, then... So, as I say, in my view, Chinese economy is plateaued and it's on its way down and I, I doubt that it will recover unless there are fundamental political reforms. And America's job, which nobody's talking about, by the way, yet, America's job is to help China manage its decline. Japan manages to decline. Can China manage its decline? I do not know. It is the world's largest country. Uh, it has a very thin resource base. It has bought its way into huge resource, um, resources around the world at a time when commodity prices have collapsed. Commodity prices are not going to recover for five to ten years. So, you know, there are, there are fundamental issues there. It's not just one or two things. Look at the issue of land and the way that land has been polluted, air has been polluted. Uh, was it just yesterday or day before yesterday I was reading about the golf tournament there and how embarrassing it was for the golfers to, to, to wear masks as they're golfing because, of course, unhealthy. You're not supposed to exercise when the air has as many particulates as it has. If you go to Japanese stores uh, which sell uh, consumables like uh, fruit or vegetables, there are sections in Japanese uh, department stores uh, which say China free produce because they're so scared of pollution in, 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 in China. The land is so polluted that two thirds of the water there is unfit for not just human consumption but animal consumption. So, I mean, it has huge problems, huge challenges. Sitting outside, we don't really, I mean, you visit, of course, so you probably know even better than I do no, I what the situation is. Other comments, other questions, please? Uh, sorry, how much time do we have? 20 minutes? 15? 15, 20 minutes. Good. 10 minutes, okay. <coughs> other questions, please, at the back there. Correct. I'm sorry, I was talking about? The new political parties yeah. that yeah. uh, What is the best case scenario where you think they, uh, the new political parties can take action to say that have the forms where this gap is going to be so You know, the changes that I've mentioned have gone through, in my view, 
totally miraculously. Because the political paralysis in India is so extreme at the moment. If I remember correctly, in the first 11 days of this current session's parliament, there was only 12 minutes of legislative business being enacted. And the reason why only 12 minutes of legislative business was enacted, in which, by the way, some of these things went through, was because parliamentarians were too busy shouting at each other, um, voting against each other, walking out, staging walkouts, and all the other things, hoping to impress the Indian population, whom they regard like little children. It does, because the U.S. is going India's way. You see, this is the, this is the tragedy. No, no, but it's true. America is going India's way. And if America continues the way it is, America will end up not just in India, but in Pakistan. So America really should take note about the challenges facing it as a country. But uh, in India, since that is the specific question you're asking, I think the political paralysis, broadly political paralysis in the country, will be broken after the elections. And whichever party comes to rule, I hope there'll be a clear winner. I think there'll be a clear winner. Um, will have the mandate then to push ahead with all kinds of changes for which the groundwork has now been laid. Um, I'll give you another example. Um, India's law minister Kapil Sibyl made the statement uh, not very long ago that he had brought to parliament a bill which was meant to create the possibility of a single exam for entrance to all universities. Now this is a highly rational and sensible thing to do because as you know we have different boards in the country. Each state in the country sets its own requirements since education is a state subject, not a central subject. So every state sets its own standards. And it's very difficult uh, for any institution to know how to evaluate a first class candidate from one board versus a second class candidate from another board. And so Kapil Sibyl's proposal was entirely rational because what happens at the moment is if you want to sit for the IITs, you sit a different exam. You want to sit for the IIMs, you sit a different. You want to go for medical, you sit a different exam. So instead of all this, the proposal was totally rational, one single exam for the whole country, and then on the basis of that performance, you go or don't go to an IIT or Indian Institute of Technology, Indian Institute of Management or Medicine or whatever. Highly rational proposal thrown out by the opposition. Why? Simply because they want to oppose it. Now, there are good rational grounds for opposing it. And if the debate had been about the rational grounds for opposing it, I would understand that. But there was no rational debate. It was just voted on party lines. You're for it, we're against it. He proposed a bill, as you know, there's huge limitations on capacity at higher education levels. So there's incredible competition for these higher education seats in India, which means, of course, that people have to pay bribes, in effect, called capitation fees to be able to get in. These are the official capitation fees. And then usually there are some unofficial capitation fees that also have to be paid in certain institutions. Kapil Sibyl proposed a bill to ban educational malpractices. What happened? Opposed on purely party political grounds. So we're in this idiotic phase in India, just as you are in the United States, where things are opposed simply because they're proposed by the other party. Now in the United States, I don't know what you folks are doing, but I hope you're doing something. In India, we have some hope because we have a slew of new political parties and the population will have a chance to choose between them. So we have not just the two biggies, not just the regional parties, we also have a whole host of traditional regional parties, but we have a whole slew of new parties coming up and the Indian population, as I say, has the opportunity to choose. So I'm quite hopeful because the Indian voter is not as stupid as our political leaders seem to believe. Our political leaders have tried to bribe voters by offering them saris, you know, the elegant dresses that Indian women wear, or offering them two kilos of rice, or five kilos of sugar, or televisions. This is an attempt on the part of political leaders to bribe the voter, really. Uh, but in, what have the Indian voters done? They've said, yes, fine, we'll have the saris, thank you very much. We'll have this two kilos of uh, rice or sugar or whatever it is, thank you. <laughs> Televisions, thank you. And then the Indian voter has gone and voted exactly as the Indian voter wants. As a result of which, India has the highest 
rejection rate of political parties in power. So I am quite hopeful about what's going to happen at the next elections. Of course, it's still maybe five or six or eight months away. It can't be later than May. It could be earlier than May, but it can't be later than May. So my view is that the Indian economy has reached the kind of bottom it's going to, to be in and that the rupee will continue to recover in spite of whatever happens in global capital flows terms, unless obviously there's a political earthquake in China or some other unforeseen tragedy. So that's the good news that India's economy is at the bottom level and we will, we will wait to see what happens at the national elections when I expect the Indian economy to begin to motor again. Yes, Nat. N Dr. Nataraj, please. Uh, so I have a question about uh, the effect of globalization on uh, income inequality. Yes. You know, um, it seems to have raised uh, uh, many people out of poverty. Yes. <laughs> Excuse me. But has it resulted in uh, you know, lowering of uh, you know, some of the regime coefficients or any kind of income inequality measures that you can make? India now has reduced its poverty rate to 22%, which is quite substantial. The only problem is the measure of poverty is so low that 22% of what, at what level? So its poverty rate has come down to 22%. At the same time as the Gini coefficient, coefficient has grown. That means the income inequality has grown. And this is part of a global trend. Uh, the global trend is that the rich have become very much richer. And though the poorer have been lifted up a little bit, They've not been lifted up substantially. At the same time, around the world, the middle classes have been shrunk in number as a matter of policy, except in two countries, India and China. It's only in India and China that there's been a growth of the middle class. And the reason for that is, of course, government policies in the case of both India and China. In China, led by the manufacturing revolution to which I referred. In India, led by the services revolution. So the IT industry, lasers, auto parts manufactured to a certain extent, but um, satellites and nuclear and all kinds of other knowledge-based industries is what has led to the rise of the middle class in India. So India and China accepted around the globe the middle class has shrunk. And this is a direct consequence of the economic policies that have been followed in globalization. Yes. So there's been emerged a new kind of very rich class, and the poor have been lifted a little bit, but only a little bit. So the challenge before us, uh, <coughs> sorry, that's my concluding statement. I will not make it just now. Any other questions before I finish? Uh, yes, sir, so Dr. Banzai. Excuse me. Yes. Um, Dr. Bamzai, I would propose to you that the reason why policies in India are not very good policies, noble, idealistic policies, are implemented rather poorly is not because people are incapable of implementing them, but it because actually it suits their pocket not to implement them. So, the Aam Admi Party, the AAP, which is expected to sweep the Delhi elections this year, is focusing only on the removal of corruption. And Kejriwal, who is the leader of this party, believes that if India could only eliminate corruption, that would sort out, we don't need to worry about policies and all that. Implementation would automatically improve, and the problem in India is implementation. It is not policy, it is not theory, it's not legislation. And though it's simple-minded and naive, I think there is at least a grain of truth in it. So he has put in place policies in his own party which are very interesting. For example, everybody who wants to stand as a candidate in any Delhi seat, because at the moment he's only contesting, or the party is only contesting Delhi seats, has to declare all their assets. And the party rule is that if you are dishonest about the assets you've declared, 
and it's discovered, whatever the legal and so on, judicial and so on consequences, is a matter between the state and, and you. But so far as the party is concerned, you'll be kicked out, and that's it. No coming back. First rule. Second rule, candidates are not chosen by a central committee. If you look at the Congress party, if you look at the BJP, all the candidates are chosen by some kind of central committee. In the Aam Admi party, every member of the party will vote for whether or not you're a fit candidate, I'm a fit candidate, to be put forward as an election candidate, as a candidate in the elections. So these are just two points. I could go into others, which give me some confidence that Kejriwal has put together a system which has a reasonable chance of succeeding. I mean, BJP could have done it, Congress could have done it, regional parties could have done it, nobody's actually done it. Very simple changes. So I'm reasonably confident that we will get good change, depending, of course, on who is elected after the elections. But there's a change of mood in the country, and that is the important thing. Uh, I quoted to somebody, I think it was maybe over our lunch faculty colloquium, that for the first time, a very important politician, Lalu Yadav, uh, has been convicted for crimes he committed two decades ago. Now, we know, you know, and I know of other very important politicians who've been involved in criminal activities. But nobody has dared to touch them. And this conviction is, in my view, a sign of things to come. And the reason the conviction has taken place is there's a change of mood in the country. The massive demonstrations we saw against corruption in the spring this year are just a, an indicator of this change of mood. The rise of new parties is an indicator of this change of mood. Um, Dr. Patnaik, please. Yes. Well, in, in my view, China may not collapse. Uh, if China collapses, as I said, this will be bad for all of us. China has to be helped by all of us to manage its decline. And if all of us try, we can help China to make a transition to at least a plateauing rather than a collapse, or a slow decline rather than a collapse. That's the first point. Uh, the second point is that if China did go down, India would be obviously only one of the countries affected. China's ability to finance infrastructure projects around the world would be, of course, substantially affected. You could argue that China has done that, and there's no necessity for it to continue doing that, particularly if commodity prices go down, which obviously, as I've said, they, they have and they will. And one could certainly accept that argument. The situation for India is that, unlike China, which is export dependent, India's economy is not export dependent, or not as export dependent. Uh, roughly, I would say China's economy is, let's say, 60%, 70% uh, export de dependent, and India's economy is probably 10% less export dependent than that. China is trying to create an internal market. India already has an internal market. The main difference between China and India is that China has an economy driven by the Communist Party and the People's Liberation Army. So it's a command economy. And so things happen because the government decides they should happen. In the case of India, the economy grows, as one commentator put it, by night, while the government is not looking. And it grows in spite of the best efforts of the government to prevent growth from taking place. So uh, all we need is less government in India and the economy will boom much more. We don't need to be scared about the Chinese part of our trade declining. What we do need to be scared about is, I'm talking from the Indian perspective, of course, what we do need to be scared about is that in, if China is in danger of collapsing, uh, Chinese Communist Party, we know what they will do, like any other government does, will try its best to exercise much stronger internal control. We see signs of that already. And if that does not work, then we know what the next 
solution is, and that is an external adventure. And if there's an external adventure, then the question is, where or in relation to which country will that external adventure take place? Will it be Taiwan? Will it be Japan? It won't be Russia, because they have good relations with Russia now. The Chinese are, anyway, taking over large parts of Siberia through illegal immigration and legal immigration. So I don't expect any problems there. Uh, there are, of course, conflicts, as you know, throughout Southeast Asia, Indonesia, Malaysia, Borneo, and all the rest, Brunei, and so on, uh, Philippines, and so on. So it could be that there's an adventure there, or it could be that there's an adventure in relation to India. Uh, you have probably been observing, being from the same background, uh, that the People's Liberation Army has been uh, indulging in small-scale uh, recce expeditions. And uh, the Indian government has tried to ignore it, has tried to downplay it. Uh, but uh, what does it mean? It remains to be seen. So that is the thing that India needs to be concerned about. And India is at least officially not concerned about it, which is, in my view, not the wisest, if that is the reality, not the wisest course of action. Uh, I think you said, Dr. Patanayak, that you'd like this to be the last question. And I'm happy with that. Uh, may I just make a concluding statement? And my concluding statement is the following. We are today in the middle of this process of globalization to which we have referred. And this process of globalization has been halted, if not temporarily reversed, as a result of what happened from 2007 onwards. So we've been going through a phase of halted or reversed globalization, a kind of de globalization. But this process will not, deglobalization process will not continue forever because the logic of our times is much greater in, uh, consolidation and integration of the global economy given technological cap capabilities as well as given the advantages of scale that operate, excuse me, I think I'm about to sneeze. <coughs> Excuse me, it is an allergy. <laughs> so the industrial, the, the, the logic of our times, technological and financial, is greater global integration. And this logic of our times is perhaps deliberately not seen by our national politicians who continue to who plow national furrows. The great issue for our times is not what role the United States will have in the new geopolitics of the future, or what role China or India will have in the, new, in the new geopolitics of the future. The great issue of our times is what kind of global civilization do we really want to build? Do we want to build a global civilization that is humane, that is just, that is environmentally sustainable, or do we want to build a kind of global, uh, a, a global civilization in which there is dog eat dog and the winner takes all? Dog eat dog and the winner takes all is the kind of civilization we have built up to now. And it's up to us to decide what the future will be. And so as I go around and speak, I try to alert people to this fundamental clash of values which is taking place around the world. And that clash of values, the outcome of that clash of values is determined by each of us, by the actions we take in terms of the daily decisions facing us whether it's the daily decisions that you face as students, we face as faculty, a housewife faces, a student faces, or whatever. So as you take your decisions, please think carefully about the global clash of values in which we are. We have the opportunity to build the greatest civilization that the Earth has seen. We also have the ability and the potential to go back into a kind of 1984 scenario. With those words, I would like to take my leave and thank you for being a very attentive audience. Thank you.